Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks, everybody, for coming. I'm glad to see everybody so excited about, uh, about this. So what I'm going to talk about today is, um, is a particular quantitative strategy that is often employed by hedge funds. And in fact, it's employed with a lot of leverage. This is going to tie in very, very well um, with the topics that Professor Sundarayas and Professor Wong are talking about. And what I want to do is uh, introduce the topic of quantitative investing, tell you a little bit about that, and then dive in particular into this one strategy. And this is related to some research that I'm doing on trying to understand what it is that's responsible for price momentum. In other words, why do you see it in markets? Because I'm going to make the argument that the market isn't completely efficient. And in fact, my view is that the reason we see this particular phenomena is because investors don't process information perfectly. So that's the reason that markets aren't, particularly, or aren't perfectly efficient. But I want to tell you uh, more today just about the characterization of momentum and give you a few thoughts on uh, what's underlying this. So it turns out, as, um, as I was walking through Penn Station about a week ago, I saw this on the cover of, uh, of the Bloomberg magazine. You can see this is the November issue. And it turns out this is perfect, because this is a guy whose name is Cliff Asnes. And there's a great story, actually, in, in this magazine about his particular firm, which had a very rough time the last couple years. And it's how they're fighting back. Okay? Turns out they had a rough time because of momentum. Okay? And so I'm going to tell you why that is. Now, um, uh, let's see. It turns out they haven't given up on momentum. And in fact, this is from inside the, uh, the magazine in the article. Since it's Bloomberg Magazine, they tell you how you can go onto a Bloomberg and look at the performance of AQR's funds. They've, it turns out they've recently launched a set of mutual funds. So in, in addition to, to playing in the hedge fund universe, which they've done for some time now, um, they're also launching some mutual funds. And if you can see, this is probably a little bit small, but you can see one particular fund that's highlighted here is the AQR Momentum Fund. Okay. So what AQR does, both with their mutual funds and with their hedge funds, is they use a set of mathematical rules to generate, to put together large, well-diversified portfolios that have a certain tilt. And it turns out for momentum, basically what they do is they bet on winners. So they buy winners and they sell losers. Okay? And what we're going to do is dive in and see exactly what that means. Now it turns out, um, to introduce the topic, this is something from a paper that's written by three guys. Uh, Asnes, Moskowitz, and Pedersen. In fact, Asnes is the same guy whose picture you just saw. The other two guys are professors at NYU and uh, in Chicago, respectively. And what this particular paper does is it looks at the presence of momentum in different asset classes. Okay? So this page, I'm not going to spend much time on these, but the green lines here represent the cumulative returns to value, momentum, and combination strategies, i.e., if you combine value and momentum. And what's pretty interesting here is you can see momentum, at least historically, and in fact, I should mention leading up to the date at which this paper was written, which was 2008, early 2008, um, momentum did very well in the US, in the UK, in continental Europe, and not so well in Japan, which is actually another interesting topic. This chart shows what if you go to different sorts of strategies. This is, um, let's see, this is an equity country selection. So in other words, make bets on whether the US is going to go up relative to the UK, relative to continental Europe, relative to, um, to Asia, based on how well those firms, how well those countries have done recently. Okay? This is bond country selection, so the same thing for government debt for the different firms. Momentum doesn't work as well here, but it's still, still positive. This is foreign currency. Okay? So in other words, do you bet on the dollar, on the euro, on the yen, on um, you know, various currencies around the globe based on how well they've done recently. Turns out momentum works quite well for currencies. And then finally, this one is, I believe, for commodities, though the headings seem to have fallen off here. And in fact, commodity momentum is another very successful strategy. Okay? So what is it that's driving momentum? Well, just let me just give you a quick um, uh, one minute guess uh, or theory on what it is that's driving momentum. Uh, I actually had did some early work on this, and um, the thing that appears to be the best, I think the best supported theory as to what's driving momentum is that investors get information, 
Okay, they receive information, and this can be from earnings announcements for individual firms. It can be news about the uh, particular country and the economic prospects of that country. Investors, we know, have a status quo bias. They tend to you know, think things are going to stay roughly the same. And um, when this new information, when they see it, they think, OK, it's going to make a difference, and the price will move in response to that new information. But in general, it won't move enough for lots of behavioral reasons. And in fact, there's some, uh, I had lunch yesterday with uh, Professor Elke Weber, and I know she and Eric Johnson are working on some really interesting behavioral theories as to what drives this. Okay? So there's a lot of neat work going on around Columbia on this specific topic. But anyway, the information isn't fully incorporated into prices. Investors don't immediately realize, they don't immediately understand the full impact of this information, so the price moves a little bit. And then it takes a long time, a year or so, for the information to be fully reflected in prices. Okay? So if you as an arbitrageur, as somebody who's kind of making bets in financial markets, you see a price move. And it turns out, interestingly, in equity markets, this is something we're not going to talk about. But if you see a price move and you can link that to information, then it's likely that that price move is going to continue. And of course, momentum in physics means you know, something that is moving along in a certain direction okay, at a certain speed is going to keep moving at that speed unless something, something stops it, right? That's exactly the phenomenon in, in financial markets. When prices start moving, they keep moving for a while. Okay? So that's the idea of momentum. Now, how do you build a momentum strategy? So I thought it would be useful here to talk about what if you want to put together a simple momentum strategy you want to do with Cl what Cliff Asnes and AQR do on your own. How would you do it? So this is a, a chart that I put together that shows how to build a momentum strategy. Okay? And I should, somehow I thought when I put this chart together that this color would look really good. I can see I was wrong there. But we're going to have to go with it. Okay? So let's say you're sitting at the beginning of April 2009. Okay? So it's what's uh, 30, March 31st, I guess. Okay? And what you're doing is you're building your portfolio that you're going to hold over the next month, over April 2009. Okay. Well, one particular momentum portfolio that you could build would be a 12-2 momentum portfolio. What does that mean? Well, what you'll do is you'll take every single stock. Let's do this in the U.S. just to keep it simple. Okay. So in the U.S., what we're going to do is we're going to look at the monthly returns to every stock that's traded on the NYSE, on Amex, or that's listed on NASDAQ. And we're going to look at their returns from 12 months ago to one month ago. So that's going to be, if you label the return for April month T, that's the portfolio we're building, right? We want to take advantage of any price movements that occur in month T in April. What we're going to do is we're going to use all of the returns on these individual securities from one year ago up until one month, up until one month ago. Okay, we're going to sum those up for each of the individual securities. And then all we're going to do is we're going to rank these securities. We're going to say, okay, which one had the highest return? over the last 12 months, minus the last one month, and then which ones had the lowest return. Okay. Now, what we're then going to do is we're going to say, OK, let's take the top 10% of the firms. So there are roughly, how many firms are there that are listed, say, across the NYC, Amex, and NASDAQ? About 5,000, yeah. So you're going to take the top 500 firms, okay, those that had the highest return over the last 12 months, and you're going to put those in a portfolio. You're going to do what's called value weight this portfolio. What that means is you'll, put more, you'll buy more of the large market cap firms, and you'll buy less of the small market capitalization firms. Okay? So the top 10% of the firms we're going to call the winner portfolio, and the bottom 10% of the firms we're going to call the loser portfolio. Okay, now again, with this idea that there's momentum, the winner portfolio, if there really is momentum in returns, that's going to keep going up right? because of momentum. It's been rising. It's going to keep rising. The loser portfolio is going to keep going down. Okay? So we're going to look at these two portfolios. We're also going to look at another portfolio, which is a long-short portfolio. Okay? Some of you have probably heard this term. It's it, it, relatively straightforward. Basically, with a long-short portfolio, what you do is you short a dollar's worth of the loser portfolio. Again, this is based on the idea that the losers are going to keep losing, right? So what we'll do is we'll borrow those shares and then we'll sell them, okay? And then, of course, at some point in the future, we got to pay back whoever we borrowed the shares from. 
And the way we're going to do that is we're going to buy back the shares, and if the price really went down, we'll be able to do that at a lower price than what we sold them at, and therefore we'll make money on our short position. Okay, so our goal here is going to be to you know, buy these winners. Hopefully they'll keep going up, sell the losers. Hopefully they'll keep going down. Okay? Now for this particular strategy, it turns out that what we're going to do is every month, at the beginning of the month, we'll rebalance the portfolio. So what that means is we'll redo our ranking period returns, okay, our formation period returns. And basically, for example, when we get to the beginning of May 2009, what we do is we you know, take off this April return and add on the March return. And then we have a new 11-month return, and we're going to rank on that, do the whole thing again, take the top 10%, the bottom 10%. And when, one of the things that you can see is with this particular strategy, there's not going to be that much turnover in the portfolio, right? Because the returns over this period are going to be pretty close to equal to the returns over this period. But obviously, once you go out 12 months, the returns are not going to be very closely linked because those returns uh, one year apart are likely to be, to be quite different. Okay? All right. I was going to ask any questions so far, but I can't do that, right? All right. So let's look at how well this strategy works. <coughs> so I'm going to look at the period here from 1949, so basically post-World War II up to 2007. So which you may say, well, why didn't you go to 2010? I'll tell you in a minute. Okay? So this shows first, what we want to see is how well we would have done with investments in different assets. So this first shows, what if you put your money in T-bills? Okay? And specifically, and I did things in logs here, so my apologies for those of you who don't understand this, but basically 10 to the 0 is 1. Everybody remember this? Kind of? Yeah. Okay, 10 to the 0 is 1, 10 to the 1 is 10, this is 100, 1,000, 10,000. So this shows if you'd invested $1 in T-bills, turns out by the time you get to the beginning of 2007, you're up to $15.73. Pretty good, right? Okay. What if you'd put your money instead in the market? So in Basically, like the S&P 500, this is the value-weighted crisp index, it turns out. But you can see how stocks have done really well, typically, historically, relative to T-bills, and that's reflected here. So with an investment in common stocks, you would have had $741.97. Okay, so what if you'd bought, instead of buying the market, you bought that portfolio of losers? Remember the worst 10% of the stocks over the last year? Well, it turns out, instead of being up $741.97, you'd be up to, from $1 in 1950, or 1949, you'd be up to $1.88. Okay, so the returns of the losers are abysmal. Okay, they're basically, they're less than 1% per year, okay, and quite a bit less than T-bills. Okay, so that's pretty impressive. There does seem to be this momentum. Basically, the things that have been going down tend to keep going down. Now, let's see what happens with the winners. Turns out we see the same thing with the winners. Okay, so there's, a, in fact, here, just a remarkable difference. The winners are actually up to, instead of $741, you're up to $41,131 by the time you get to 2007 from a $1 investment. Perfect. Okay, um, so what do we see? Well. Now let's look at the excess returns, and basically what, what we saw in the last chart is reflected here. Basically the momentum has a mean return of 16.5%. So this is the difference between the winners and the losers. The difference is actually over this period 16.5% per year, which is a huge number, right? The mean market return over and above T-bills is 7.7%, okay? Um, the volatility of the momentum portfolio is a little higher, but not much. The sharp ratio is quite a bit bigger. And moreover, the beta of the momentum portfolio is actually negative. So it's negatively correlated with the market. Okay? What this means is if you put them together into a portfolio, you combine the market and this momentum portfolio, you're up to a sharp ratio of 1.02 compared to the market of 0.53. So if you build a portfolio that has the same volatility as holding the market, you would have gotten a return that's just about double. Okay? So it's remarkably successful. Okay? Now, let me show you what's happened recently with momentum. Okay, because you may have wondered before, well, why didn't he show us the returns from 2007 on? So this here you see really, really good returns again, right? Except for one problem. This is actually the past losers. Okay, not the winners. These are the winners down here. So our winners and losers have reversed. Okay, so what happened? Well, so this, I actually started this chart at a very 
opportune date, March 8, 2009. Anybody know what's special about March 8, 2009? Market reversed, okay? So it turns out the market fell from roughly 2007, the end of 2007, early 2008. The market started falling, and it fell a lot. It fell by over 60%, okay? And actually, the day on which the Dow got the lowest over that period was actually March 8th, okay? So starting March 9th, it started turning around. And it turned out when it turned around, basically those losers started doing really well. Now, what kind of firms were there in this loser portfolio? Lots of financials, okay? So it turns out Citi was in there, okay? Um, there were also a bunch of highly levered firms. It turns out there's a firm called International Paper that was in there, okay? International Paper has a lot of leverage, and it was looking really, really shaky in the middle of the financial crisis, and people were afraid that it might go under. Well, it turns out once the market started rebounding, international paper did really well. The winner portfolio had a lot of firms in it. One particular firm was a firm called AutoZone. Does anybody know what AutoZone is? They sell you know, like used, used car parts, things like that, right? Do those two firms like that do pretty well in a recession? Yeah. So it turns out AutoZone had done really, really well as the market fell. But when the market rebounded, it did okay, but it didn't do great. So there was a big difference between the losers and the winners. So here, if you had a momentum bet on, you got crushed, absolutely crushed, okay? So when you see on the cover of the Bloomberg magazine, say where it says AQR fights back, this is what they're fighting back from. Okay, now let's look back and see, do we see anything similar in other historical periods? Okay, so here I picked another propitious uh, period, which is June 1932 to December 1945. Okay, so what's What's, why did I pick June 1932? Any guesses? What happened in like 29 through 32? Did the market do well? <laughs> yeah, not that well actually. So it turns out the market over that period, anybody know how, how far down it was? Turns out about 90%. So the Dow in September of 1929 was at 381 at its peak and it fell to 44. Okay, so if you think the crash of you know, 2008, 2009 was bad, 32 was a lot worse. So I started here in July, okay, or in June, I guess, and what you see is we see the same pattern. So basically, this line that goes way up, it's not the winners, it's the losers. And the losers, you see just a phenomenal rebound, okay? And in contrast, the winners, and by the way, this is a long period, right? This is a long, long period. This is about, what, 13 years? And the losers do much, much better than the winners. Okay, so here's some numbers. Okay, so this is the 32 period. Basically, let's look at just the two months following the market bottom. The market was up by 82%. Over those two months, the losers outperformed the winners by 206%. So the losers gained 236%. The winners only gained 30. In our more recent period, the three-month period from March through May, the market was up by 30%, so nowhere near as much as this. And by the way, when the market falls 90% and then goes 80, up 82%, is it only down 8%? Okay, good. Good to see, yeah. So the market was still way, way down from the peak, right? But um, it turns out when it bounced back, the dramatic gains were all for those losers, all for the stocks that had really been pushed down. That's what we saw more recently in 2009, too. Okay? Um, all right. Now, Ah, I was supposed to ask something here, but I guess I'm not allowed to ask questions anyway. So let me tell you something. One of the things you should, when you're looking at this, you should be thinking is, well, wait a minute. If the market's going up by 82%, these losers are going up by 236%, and here the market's going up by 29%, and the losers are going up by 149%, what's one possible explanation of this? Yeah, oh wait, I'm not supposed to ask questions. I keep forgetting this, I'm sorry. Okay, so one, <laughs> one possible explanation, I think somebody said it there, is they've got a high beta, right? So let's look at this. I'm gonna skip that slide. And here what I do is I show, I've plotted, I've calculated using a set of rolling regressions, okay? The betas for the losers and for the winners. So all I do is I run a regression, probably most of you have seen this, where you regress the returns of this portfolio, the excess returns of this portfolio on the market. 
And what you see is particularly in these periods following the big market down moves, the betas of those losers get really, really high. What's driving that? Well, it turns out it's two things. One, if the market's gone way, way down, and you've got a bunch of firms who have gone way, way down, probably one good reason why they've gone down is they're high beta stocks to start out with. Okay? The other thing is that as these firms fall, okay, um, it's if they're losing that much money, one of the things that Professor Sundarayasan is going to talk about is leverage. Well, firms have leverage too, right? They have a lot of debt. And as their market capitalization falls and falls and falls, they become more levered and their betas shoot up dramatically. Okay? So it turns out that the betas of the momentum portfolio become very, very negative. Why? Well, because to build a momentum portfolio, you're buying these winners and you're selling these losers. You're selling the very high beta stocks. So what this means is for the momentum portfolio, when the market starts shooting up, it's going to really shoot down. Those losers are going to do well, okay? And since you're shorting those losers, that's a bad thing, okay? So one of the things we could, oh, and by the way, this is the same, uh, similar chart, but for the more recent period. Here you can see the effect is, if anything, even more dramatic. Here are the betas of these loser portfolios, and by the way, this is after the collapse of the tech bubble. The betas are up to like three, three and a half, and in the more recent financial crisis, roughly the same level. One of the things we can potentially do is hedge out this market risk. So let's see what happens if we do that. So this plot shows now this unhedged line. And by the way, here I'm, I'm making a little bit of a jump. These are the cumulative log returns for the unhedged momentum portfolio. That's the green line. And for the hedged momentum portfolio, which is the blue line. So basically what I'm going to do, I know this thing has a negative beta with the market. Okay? I know that when the market goes up, it's going to go down. So one of the things I can do is I can hedge that out. How do I do that? Well, I add a little bit of market exposure to my momentum portfolio. Right? And if I do that just right, what that'll mean is the movements of this portfolio are now insensitive to the market. Okay? So uh, I'm sorry, I'm, gonna, I'm running out of time here, so I'm going to jump over this quickly. But you can, see, you can see that what happens is this actually makes a big difference. Okay? It turns out the cumulative return here is, uh, is about minus 50% for this unhedged portfolio by the time you get to 49. And this, you can see, is actually slightly positive. This is up about 30%. So it actually makes a big difference. And oops, um, if you look over the longer period, we don't get quite as much benefit from the hedging in the more recent financial crisis, but there's still something there. Okay? Now, one of the things that's interesting, and this is what actually I'm working on now, which unfortunately I don't have a whole lot of completed research to, to show you. But, it turns out that even after you hedge this momentum portfolio, there's still a lot of predictability. And basically, momentum does lousy when you're in a bad financial time, when people are scared, basically when the market has gone down. So what's one other strategy you could try? Well, one would be to actually reverse your bets on momentum when the market has been down. Okay? And so what I do now is I look at a strategy where if the market's been down for two years, you reverse your momentum portfolio. Okay? And it turns out if you do this, what you see is this is the dynamic strategy. And you can see it does a lot better. Now, it, by the way, it doesn't look like it's that much better, right? Because you, you look at this and it's only this much higher. That can't be very much. Well, it turns out the profits from this strategy, if you put in a dollar here, this is the standard momentum strategy, you're up to 387. Pretty good by the time you get to here. If you'd hedged it, you're up to $1,421. And if you'd gotten out and, in fact, reversed your momentum bets when the market over the last two years has been down, it turns out you're up to $36,000 by the time you get here. So a dramatic difference. Okay? So um, what's causing this? Well, it seems like this idea that people get fixated on their views and therefore don't respond to new information particularly bad information about bad firms that have done poorly, doesn't seem to work when times have been really, really bad. Things seem to reverse. Okay? So anyway, I'm doing more work on that. And once that work's completed, hopefully I'll have a paper pretty soon. Uh, I will post that and uh, you can all see it. Okay, thank you.